Well, welcome, Adam Rossi. Thank you so much for joining me today on the Ridiculously Human podcast, bud. Hey, Gareth. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, man. It's, uh, it's been so cool, like, researching uh, you as a guest. Uh, one of the things I, was, um, I found out about you is that you went to Virginia Tech. And uh, we've already obviously swapped a couple of emails on this, but I just wanted to tell like a quick little story, which is kind of a nice way to to get into the conversation. But when I was uh, 18, I went to America, like working in a summer camp. And then I um, did some traveling afterwards for like a few months. And one of the stops was actually visiting a friend of mine that I did. He was a, a fellow bank counselor um, at uh, Virginia University. A UVA and um, he at, at the time it was a game like a football game which was UVA versus Virginia Tech like literally I was there for that weekend and apparently like I didn't know you know but this is like a massive rivalry and man growing up in South Africa you watch like American TV shows right and you see like these games and then they go back afterwards and have these big parties with like kegs and everything like that it was exactly that. It was like <laughs> literally a day that I'll never, ever forget in my entire life. 60,000 people at the football game, massive party afterwards, kegs everywhere. Like, I don't really remember the end of the night because it was, you know, everyone was so drunk, but man, what a, what an experience. Yeah. You went to one of the best rivalries in college football, Virginia Tech versus UVA. Now we've, definitely dominated the series over the past 20 years, Virginia Tech go Hokies. But uh, the fact that you saw it in either stadium, wonderful experience. UVA is a great place as well. Charlottesville, beautiful city. And uh, yeah, the parties, um, you, you you got the American experience as an 18 year old. I'm glad you did that. Yeah, I know it was super cool. And then you sent me some like YouTube videos of the, the games at uh, Virginia Tech. And I was like, I've got to come back and I've got to go watch one of those. They just seem incredible. When you hear enter Sandman and you have 80,000 people jumping up and down and the football team runs out. I mean, a lot of people have said, you know, NFL players, they say, what's the loudest stadium you've ever played in? And they'll say Blacksburg, Virginia Tech, and Hokies, because that stadium is nuts. Mm -hmm. That's so, that's so crazy. And is it like a good sort of feeder for, you know, some of the sort of um, NFL teams? We've, we've, we have a lot of, you know, NFL players, uh, um, Michael Vick, you probably heard of, uh, was a quarterback at Virginia tech, um, tons of good players. Yeah. So uh, we've, um, uh, uh, historically, um, been a football powerhouse, maybe fallen on some hard times over the past few years, but we're in a rebuilding year. So keep your eye on Virginia tech football this year. And, and like, as a sort of alumni is it something that you go back to like can you easily get tickets or is it kind of like just mostly students so one of the things that uh that i do is i am uh, a mentor to a lot of virginia tech uh engineering teams so a team that does um an underground boring machine um a team that uh um builds uh, uh robots that participate in these competitions so I like to go down and work with those teams. I'm also uh, uh, a board member for the Apex Entrepreneurship Center. So kids that are trying to start companies uh, in college, uh, or at least are very interested in entrepreneurship and maybe one day want to. So I typically, like for me, the ideal you know weekend is like go down there on like a Thursday or Friday, work with students, then go to a football game on Saturday. Um, that would be like an awesome week for me. <laughs> that's so cool man i think it's i think it's really cool to kind of like stay in touch with with youngsters you know and someone like yourself who's obviously done very well in in their life and their business um I'm, I'm sure that they are like extremely grateful to have you going there giving them sort of real life advice and and experience um you know as a lecturer yeah i mean so i think that one of the things that um wasn't around when I, I started my company in 1999, I was 26 years old. And at the time, entrepreneurship was not cool, right? There were a lot of people who were saying, you're an idiot to start a company, you know, especially I had a pretty good job, you know, and people are like, why are you leaving a good job? You know, you had security. Um, so we didn't really celebrate kind of entrepreneurship or 
you know, now it's, it's kind of okay to say I tried something and, and it didn't work and now I'm trying something else. Then it would have kind of carried a big stigma. And so one of the things I think is really good about, you know, a lot of the um, online materials, a lot of the, the college course uh, materials are they're they're now a lot more supportive of, of, of young people with ideas and this entrepreneurial kind of spirit. And so I just love to play a part in that to, to, to either, you know, directly help with like a business model, a plan, getting funding. I invest in a lot of these companies. I invested a ton of money in a company called Lawn Starter that was started by two kids out of Virginia Tech that mowed lawns. They were like, we want to have this platform for lawn care which is they're going to, they did a hundred million dollars in revenue last year. So they're crushing it. Um, but you know, I, I, as an investor or even just as, as a person that says you can do this because I wasn't, you know, the smartest guy in the world. I didn't have any money. I was, I didn't have a pot to piss in and I was able to start a successful company. So I think even just that kind of nudges people, young people into a direction where they're like, well, if he could do it, maybe I could as well. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's it. Like it's that, it's that relatability that uh, makes it seem like, okay, cool. This, this must be possible. You know, like if, if Adam can do it and he started with, you know, from scratch with pretty much nothing, then heck, uh, I might as well give it a crack at least. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I wish I had heard kind of more stories like that when I started, before I started my company, because it was a very, very scary kind of endeavor. Um, you know, I was petrified uh, that I would fail. And, you know, just any, anyone who I could talk to at the time that had started a company, I was like, I didn't care what the company was. I didn't care if it was a hot dog stand. I was like, I want to hear your story. Like, tell me everything, you know? Both your, like your granddad and your dad are, are entrepreneurs as well. Did you kind of lean on them much for advice? Yeah, it's, it's, I, I think that the most beneficial thing they did for me was not advice. They didn't have any money to give me or loan me. Um, it was just the art of the possible. My grandfather in Torrington, Connecticut had a very successful highway uh, construction company. My father moved down to Virginia uh, when I was young, away from his family and everything he knew and started a, a, a construction company and a concrete plant in uh, Southwest Virginia. And so for me as a kid, um, when I was young, I'd be drawing like logos for companies and like, you know, I'm going to have a company and, you know, because they did. Right. And, and, you know, I, we grew up really poor, uh, because my father, if he made any money, it'd be like, I got to buy a backhoe. I got to buy a bulldozer. I got to buy a, you know, excavator. And so I kind of saw like, look, this takes a lot of sacrifice and dedication, but it's possible. And so I, I didn't really, it's hard to give it like for my father to give advice. I didn't really talk to him about like, Hey, I'm starting a company. What do you think? Um, it was more just like living in that family um, where it was like normal, right? It was normalized uh, that you would start a company. That was the most helpful. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, like as a kid, not that you, are really aware of it you know but but you you're pretty much a sponge and uh you know that, that like you said that is your your normal because that's what your dad does so it's almost like part of your dna that okay cool well i'm probably going to start something at some point and it's going to be risky but you know why not let's go for it that's my you know i've got three kids that are 13 to 18 years old 13 16 and 18 and that's something that my wife and I talk about all the time is they are sponges. They are constantly watching everything that we do from the time they were born until now. And, you know, if you try to tell my kids something, they're, they're headstrong, you know, they don't want to listen to it, but they watch what we do, which kind of keeps my wife and I on our toes. It's like, okay, I'm not going to let myself get, you know, out of shape here. Like I'm, I'm, I'm going to stay in shape because I'm trying to tell them your health is important. And if I'm not taking it seriously, they'll just look at what I'm doing, not what I'm saying. And so it, 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 you know, I know you, you feel the same way about fatherhood that it's just, this, it's like this hard job and you have to 
model everything you want the kids to do because that's what they're going to do, what they watch, not what you say. And I think that's almost like the same in life as general, in general, especially like if you're a leader, like leadership in, you know, in my sort of opinion, sometimes just gets like uh, made sort of too complex. Like if you just go by the sort of uh, theory that lead through action mm -hmm. or lead by action, um, then you can't probably going to get the, almost the results that you want to see from, from your team members, you know, like just just be that person that that takes the action um you know be the be the change you want to see and you know that goes for for leadership for for parenthood um yeah and it's a it's just a way of of doing things correctly because people well they don't like getting told what to do most of the mm -hmm. time you know like you said kids they, they definitely don't add well especially if they're headstrong and um yeah the kids are sponges like uh, my my daughter she's she's not even two years old and uh, the other morning I was busy like we we go for a cycle every single morning and uh, I was busy getting the bicycles out and um, I just like heard in the background she was like playing with I don't know what it was she had something in her hand and she goes M A Y A and I was like what like she was spelling her name out you know and it's just because every night in the bath we'll like write on the shower wall uh, with these like shower pens. Like, and I'll do her name and other things. And then all of a sudden she just says it yeah. out of the blue. I was like, what? It's crazy. Yeah. It, it makes you watch what you say though. Yeah. <laughs> Especially Absolutely. when you get mad or something else, because I mean, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's this, you're exactly right though. The same at work. I mean, I, I had a company with 250 people uh, before we sold to a, a publicly traded company that was much larger. And um and I felt like that was hard to directly kind of interact and influence everyone in the company. We started getting just really big. So now my companies are, are much smaller by design. And, you know, you have the luxury of of saying, you know, no asshole policy. Like we're, we're not going to allow, you know, we're not going to hire somebody that we just, you know, well, they're effective, but we don't like them personally. They, they, they're going to clash with us. Um, uh, and, you know, and you have that kind of one on one interaction every day with folks. And it's such a joy to work with the people I work with, um, because they're all kind of aligned and, you know, helpful and, uh, you know, good people. And it's, again, you know, I, I can feel myself getting angry, you know, we, we drop the ball on something. And then it's like, hold on a minute, like, these are, you know, don't, don't show anger here. You wouldn't want them to show anger if, if you did something, you know, boneheaded. And uh, and and I think it's much easier when it's a small group like that. When it gets big, people start getting impersonal and they can start, you know, firing off nasty emails and treating people poorly. And uh, so I've tried to never kind of get that big again in any organization I'm affiliated with. What do you think the kind of like, I don't know, the right, the right word, maybe threshold is for the size of a company where you can sort of have some sort of oversight and maybe control over the culture and stuff like, you know, is it 10, 20, 50 people? What do you think? I, I think 50 is kind of a magic kind of threshold. I just seem to remember that as a, as you know, when we kind of cross that threshold, like a lot of things had to change, you know what I mean? The systems, the HR people, the, you know, like when you first start off and it'll be like, where's the employee handbook? It's like, we don't need one. You know, we, we all know what we're doing here. And, you know, and then you start getting a little bigger and it's like, oh, maybe we need those policies, you know? Um, I mean, I just did it in my little um, uh, ballistic and explosive shielding company, Total Shield. Everyone was like, what are our holiday days? And I was like, you just, just, you know, take the, if you, you know, if you celebrate a holiday, like take it, you know? And, and, and then my CFO was like, we need to have a list like, cause you know, like just the not having a policy was causing more anxiety than having a policy. Um, we're still small, but you know, that I think at 50, um, and believe me, there are people who run organizations with thousands of people and they're able to, you know, create a, a kind of core culture and, 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 and I think manage it maybe a little bit better than I was able to. Um, but for me, it was very weird to have a company where like, I didn't know everyone, you know? So you'd walk in and be like, Hey, you work here. Okay. You know, and it was just like, this is getting odd to me. 
I'm do just you, not cut out for that. Do you cut, count yourself as a, like a people's person? So did like managing people and, you know, setting a culture and, you know, socializing with them come naturally to you? I'm very introverted. And so I had to learn this stuff. I was not comfortable um, speaking in front of groups or um, being a leader necessarily. Uh, but I was very opinionated about how I wanted things to be and, and kind of my level of performance and excellence. And so, you know, there's a point where I was young where I was like, I have to learn. These. I'm not a natural leader. Um, I'm not an extrovert. I need to learn this stuff. And one of the like turning points for me was in scouts. It was, uh, you know, Boy Scouts. It's the first time that a lot of folks have a leadership role. Like you become a patrol leader, you become a uh, senior patrol leader, you know, there's, there's like duties. And I was kind of like a rebel, you know, I was, I was like, you know, the scoutmaster would tell us to do something and I'd make snarky comments and I would, you know, goof off. And he pulled me aside one day and he's like, Hey, I need you to shape up because you're influencing a lot of other guys. And I was like, I don't have any influence. Like, you know, I, I don't have any leadership position. He's like, there's like, you know, a bunch of people that are listening to what you're doing and they're doing it too. And he's like, if you want to be constructive, you can be, you know, the patrol leader and you're going to see that like, it's really easy to be snarky and kind of like negative when you're not a leader, but when you are a leader. And so I gave it a try and he was right. It was like, now I was the guy saying, Hey, we should be doing this. And there'd be some other snarky guy. And I'd have to figure out like, okay, I don't have any real authority over this guy. He's my classmate. I have to convince him. I have to like finesse this. And it was actually like a really good experience as a kid. It was like, okay, like being a leader takes work. You have to, I, I read books on it. I, I watched seminars on it um, because I was not a born leader. I think it's so cool how like one person can almost you know, may, maybe not change the trajectory, but at least have such like a, a slight shift on the trajectory of your life by saying, hey, Adam, listen, bud, you know, you've actually got some leadership potential here and uh, qualities. Uh, you need to sort of up your game, buddy. And, you know, who knows if he didn't have that discussion with you where you would be in a way. No, you're exactly right. I mean, his name was Larry Atkins, great, you know, volunteer, uh, civic minded person. And, he, you know, that was a turning point for me. And and it's weird how, um, yeah, people can influence you profoundly. And I'm sure he wouldn't remember the conversation. He was, you know, having these conversations all the time with, with, you know, boys in the scout troop and, um, and it, it's something though that, you know, when I, I coach, I, I have an internship program in the summer. Um, I mentor a lot of, you know, young people, particularly young men. I think I just have a more of a more to offer maybe. And I'm mindful of that. It's like, you know, you can just influence someone profoundly with the right kind of interaction and you can really demoralize someone with the wrong interaction you you have to be careful yeah you do you know like um yeah and and i mean it, it's great that uh it's great that you're just aware of this you know like uh, you this is once again you've experienced it so now the guys that that you're helping you you just like okay cool i'm i'm totally in tune here i know that i've got to like be careful with what i say um, because it can be can be life changing for these guys. So I actually think you wrote about Larry the other day on Twitter. I, the name the name make like I don't know. It's familiar for some reason. You you wrote about him maybe. Uh, unfortunately, he he just passed away, and so you know I saw his obituary, and um, you know he's one of those people that uh, yeah I'm I'm sure I've written about him and and mentioned him, and uh, you know what was really amazing about him was he was he didn't even have a son in the scout troop. He had a daughter. Um, he was, he was just a, uh, a person that really wanted to give back. And, you know, there's a lot of people like that in all of our lives that are, they're altruistic, right? They really care about the next generation after them. And, you know, if we can, uh, I, I, I always say, 
the world belongs to the young, right? Like I'm 50 years old. Um, so I don't consider myself old, but I'm not a young person. And I've had these amazing uh, experiences in life. I've been fortunate beyond all measure. Um, and so now there's, you know, but eventually like we have to say we are dedicated to this next generation. And it's a little bit of a bummer when I see older people that still behave, I think in kind of selfish ways. Um, Cause it's like, what are we living for here? It's the kids, man. Like the, what are we doing? You know? What do you consider like self in selfish ways? So I think, um, I think people that uh, say I'm too busy to, uh, successful people, especially, right? I'm too busy to help. Uh, if someone tries to reach out to them, I'm not going to take your call. Uh, you know, I'm too important for you. Uh, I don't want to, you know, be bothered with this. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that I think are, or, or, and this is a different thing. I don't necessarily know that it's selfish. Maybe it is. I, I'm also seeing people who are against families and kids, like, if not overtly hostile, there's this message that's kind of getting out there that like, for the good of the planet, we shouldn't have kids or you should focus on you and, 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 you know, kids are a, a distraction or they're too expensive. I'm hearing that a lot, you know, and that to me is a very corrosive idea because, you know, we're well below replacement level of population in, in the United States, in Germany, in Japan, in China. It's happening kind of globally, all the developed countries. And I'm, you know, a population crash isn't pretty, but I also think just saying uh, that there's something wrong with having a family or it's, you know, it, you're, you're hurting the planet by having kids or I, I don't know, th this is an extreme version of what I consider this kind of selfish ideology where it's like, hey, we were given all of these benefits of growing up in a prosperous uh, economy and we had a great education system and we had people that were willing and generous with their time and money and making opportunities. And it, it is incumbent on us to do the same. And if we start withdrawing and saying like, oh, I'm going to, you know, I'm not interested in kids. I don't like kids. I don't want to help kids. Even if you don't have kids of your own, that idea, like, okay, here's another stupid thing. When I was a kid, if you were walking down the sidewalk and school was on, you would get hassled by every adult, right? Like, why aren't you in school? What's up? Um, now people are like, well, I, it's not my business. I don't, you know, and, and, and it's like, okay, that's, that's not good, you know, as a society, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And it's, it's, it's kind of weird. Like you, um, you know, you, you, you have these people who said exactly like, you know, what you just said, that's they're, they're kind of against kids and whatnot, but I always try to like almost flip it on them. So you go, well, um, what, what about you though? I mean, you know, you, you were a kid, like, should your parents not have had you? I mean, that's really what you're saying. And then, I mean, once again, like I said, it's an, it's an ideology really, isn't it? And, 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 and the funny thing about a lot of these ideologies, which are existing in our current time is that they actually haven't really even thought these things through one little bit, you know, as soon as you start digging a little deeper, you just have to ask two questions and then they're like, Oh no, well, you know, oh well, and then they'll start shouting at you like, Oh, well you, you're racist or, you know, like some, mm -hmm. some stupid insults where you're like, well, okay. I mean, that doesn't even make sense. Like your insults. Um, it's because they're just kind of jumping on the bandwagon. They, this is what they've kind of been effectively brainwashed into thinking. And um, it's, it's kind of sad because we actually, you know, throughout history, we've often relied on the children and the, the, the young teenagers and stuff to be the revolutionaries, you know? Yep. And it feels like that's, that's a bit different at the moment where they're the brainwashed ones and they're not going to be the ones that are changing things. M maybe I, not everywhere, but, but it definitely seems to be a, lot, a large contingent of them. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, I think there's this, there's different forces kind of at work that are are kind of contributing to this mindset. I mean, you know, it, as, a, as a parent, the thing I'm most worried about with my kids is not necessarily even those 
kind of what I would consider to be almost like Marxist, you know, kind of ideologies um, that that are some like happening at kind of university levels, um, you know, this this kind of thinking or these these ideas that like the 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 planet is dying and we need to to have less people and that's the answer, you know, or we need to stop farming, you know. My kids are kind of immune to those messages, like because they've just grown up in a family where like we have a farm and we want you know, we celebrate kids. And when we have a family get together, there's a million kids running around and like, they're immune to those ideas. What I think I'm most worried about for them is just the effect of the isolating effect of technology. And so, I mean, I'll give you an example. I, I have a young employee. Um, his first girlfriend was at age 24. Which is which is very late, but it's not. He's not atypical. Like a lot of young people, their kind of development timeline has shifted to much later in life, right? So, like driver's license, like we would get it at sixteen, they might get it at like eighteen or twenty. You know, first kind of serious relationship with a boy or girl, like much later. You know, maybe ours was thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Theirs is like you know twenty one, twenty two, twenty three, twenty four. And I think it's because of technology, right? So you're just, you're, you're, you're playing video games, you're consuming kind of videos, you can, you know, there's like pornography, there's all this stuff that kind of can, can allow you to be isolated, but still kind of simulate like human contact. And so, you know, with AI, like girlfriends or boyfriends, potentially for like young people, like that's the thing I'm most worried about for my kids, just because it's going to get powerful and I don't want them to lead that life of like high technology and low human contact. I think it's very, very treacherous. My hope, right. Is that like deep down, um, there's the human spirit, right. And, and the human spirit knows like what it wants and like what feels right. And I feel like, like even now, like talking about what you're talking about, there, there's definitely things to be concerned about. But at the same time, there, there's there's a renaissance going on when it comes to so many things, you know, like especially the, the fact that, you know, it, it's a double-edged sword. We, we have so much information, which is almost too much, or it is yeah. too much. But at the same time, we have access to so much information. So things like ancient histories and ancient ways of doing things and you know, those things are kind of having this renaissance as well. So people are going, wait, my, my grandparents didn't do this or they didn't eat that or whatever. Like this is how they did things. I'm going to try and do that a little bit. So it, it almost feels like this, this, this battle that's going mm -hmm. on at the moment, doesn't it? Like digital versus renaissance stuff, like old school stuff. And it's a, in a way, it's kind of a nice time to be alive. And, and I, I don't know, I just have like faith that, that the human spirit knows what it wants and it's going to go, listen, okay, we tried the digital stuff and it's got lots of great benefits, but actually we need to find a real like comfortable middle ground. I like your, your attitude. I mean, you, you've got that kind of optimistic message and I think you're right. I mean, like we're having this conversation right now. Would we have met, you know, without, uh, this technology without X. I mean, like I, I've met so many amazing people. I've had conversations with people all around the world and I'm listening to podcasts that are just fascinating to me. I mean, just amazing people. And, you know, like I, I, I restored a 1972 triumph trophy that was in like basket, like boxes. It was a basket case. And I did it all by watching a guy in Britain who recorded every repair video to his Bonneville. It was close enough to mine. I would take my laptop out there. I would play it. I would fix it, play it. Fix, and I and now this motorcycle runs better than the day it came off the factory assembly line. Like the amount of beneficial material that we have access to, you're right, is amazing. And it does feel like we had that kind of movement in the 60s where it was like a back to nature kind of hippie movement. And it does kind of feel like uh, we're almost having another one of those movements where people have been like, okay, enough, you know, video games and like TikToks, like I want to farm. I mean, it's weird. Like if I post something about my greenhouse or my orchard or people are like, 
oh my God, tell me about that. You know? And it's like, okay. You know, like I, I, typically I'm, I'm thinking, oh, the most beneficial thing I can post is something about like investing or entrepreneurship. And then I'll just like happen to post like a picture of my greenhouse. And it's like, that's what people are interested in. It does feel like there's a movement kind of happening now. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and like, that's, that's what like gives me the hope, you know, because it's easy to get discouraged. Um, very easy, you know, especially like when you, you, you do spend quite a bit of time online and you're like, oh shit, so what's happening here? But, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, if you take a, take a step back and you go, okay, cool. What's really going on here? Um, then I, then I think there, there's definitely a lot of hope. Adam, I just wanted to read a, a, a tweet of yours, which almost like serves as then like a nice sort of um, platform to, to launch into a couple of questions, right? So you said, I started a software company when I was 24 year years old. Leila and I had negative net worth and no cash, but we did have major advantages. Young, lived modestly, no kids yet. Leila earned a paycheck. I had so much worry back then, but in retrospect, why? And I think that's like awesome, you know, like, so if you were a youngster now starting out in entrepreneurship, what, like say, say it was you, right? And you were starting from scratch. What would you kind of do? I love this question. I, when I'm talking to young founders, um, I almost imagine like, I can't talk to myself when I was your age, but I can talk to you. I wish I could send message back to my young self because I was, uh, I was so petrified of being a failure, right? So when you start a company, it's very, you're kind of putting yourself out there. Your family members hear about it, your coworkers, you know, you give your notice, you say, I'm, I'm starting my own company. And you know, there's a bunch of eyes on you, right? And so I was just, I was petrified that like, I'm going to be a failure. I'm going to be embarrassed. Um, I'm going to be a loser, you know? Um, and I was also weirdly worried about, you know, I didn't have, my wife and I, we were like, you know, we each owed $35,000 in student loans. So we had a negative $70,000 net worth. We lived in the junkiest apartment we could find. We had beater cars. We had like nothing going on. And yet I was weirdly worried about like bankruptcy. And like, if I could transmit a message back and be like, what the hell are you worried about? You don't have anything anyways. Like might as well just go for it. And in terms of people thinking you're a loser or whatever, that's changed a lot, you know, that, that we can kind of celebrate that now. But I would even be like, what are you worried about that for? Like, it, it, what's the worst that could have happened if you went for it? And it didn't work out like chill out. That's what I would tell myself. Like, it's not worth all the nights that I just laid there looking out the window at the stars. And I'd just be like, am I going to, is this going to work? Like, am I going to make it? Like, is I, am I going to be a success or a failure? I was just like constantly worried and eaten up by it. And it didn't help me. Uh, I think, yeah. So I, I tell that to uh, founders all the time. I say, what you need to to remember is your health is super important. I didn't respect my health when I started my company. Um, your mental health is super important. You know, I was working 120 hours a week, sleeping four hours a night, you know, holding one eye open, typing with one hand, you know, like I, it was a very, very uh, uh, hard way to, to be on myself. And so what I, what I tell you know, young founders is I would have been in the same place if I had spent a couple weekends with my friends and I had not worked 120 hours, but maybe, you know, 60 or 70 hours. If I had, you know, said, I'm going to get a gym membership and I'm going to, you know, like I probably would have been at the same place or at worst, like maybe it would have taken me another year, but it would have been so much healthier. Right. Um, I tell them, you know, you have to value and make time for your relationship with your spouse. Um, you know, there are all these things that, you know, I hang out with a bunch of entrepreneurs who have started companies that you would absolutely know and recognize, right? Huge successes. And the amount of people who have had divorces, major health issues, obesity, um, stress-related uh, health issues, like, you know, 
heart disease and uh, diabetes and all, all these things, you know, it, it would shock you. It's much higher than the general population, which is sad, right? These people have made a bunch of money, but they kind of ran their relationships into the ground, ran their bodies into the ground. I was lucky that I sold my company when I was 39. You know, I was pretty young when I started. I was pretty young when I sold. And I was young enough where I could kind of recover from some of those really bad habits. Anyways, that was a long answer. But I would tell myself, chill out, focus more on health, and it'll still be okay. It's amazing the, what humans trade off for success. And uh, we it's easy to get stuck on that sort of like hamster wheel and um, go, well, flip and I've just got to make it here. And, you know, m my, my history is I was an investment banker for, for 20 years. And then I started working for myself. And what I found that uh, when I started working for myself, there was almost this guilt where I was like, uh, shit, I should be at my computer, like working, you know, um, I, like to now go to the gym. It's, uh, I don't feel like it's the right thing to do. But when I was working as an investment banker, I'd be like, it's uh, it's whatever three o'clock in the afternoon, I'm going for an hour session in the gym for a swim or whatever. And uh, I didn't feel any guilt there whatsoever. So it's, it's a weird like mindset thing, isn't it? Like once you work for yourself, you, you almost feel like, oh, well, if I'm not here for this hour, then, you know, I don't know, I, I might miss out on something. It's a very, very weird uh, mentality. I mean, I, what was even weirder for me was, uh, you know, I sold my company and had, you know, unlimited time, uh, had resources, could could spend that time however I wanted. And uh, a friend of mine, before I sold my company, or right when I sold my company, he had sold his company. And he's like, we need to sit down at lunch and I need to warn you, something bad is about to happen. He's like, if every day is like Saturday, it's cool for like a week. And then you're going to start like freaking out. And he's like, he, he's like, it's weird. Like I would feel guilty just sitting down during the day and reading a book. He's like, it could even be a business book. He's like, I felt guilt. It's like, shouldn't I be doing something? Shouldn't I start another company? Shouldn't I be doing something more constructive? Shouldn't I be, you know? And he's like, it's a book. Like, you know, cause I was only reading at night. It was the only time I ever had, you know, when I had my company and now I have time during the day, like, okay, reading, that's not frivolous, but like, he still felt guilt. He was explaining this to me and I was like, yeah, I don't think this is going to happen. And then sure enough, it exactly happened, you know? Um, so I call it like the book of knowledge. Like anytime I know someone that exits a company, I'm like, Hey, we need to have lunch. I'm going to tell you a bunch of things that are going to happen to you. You're going to think I'm wrong. Uh, and then you're going to see, and you need to be prepared. You need to work through this stuff or it can really mess you up. I think you you need like people, well, like yourself, of course, that now gives people advice on, on these sort of things. Like, you know, if you're going into retirement, uh, you need someone to go, okay, this is actually what it's going to be like. Just so you know, you know, you think the grass is like so much greener and you're leaving work and now you've got all the time to do whatever you want. But actually you're, you're a human and you have these sort of needs and necessities and requirements to almost be busy, you know, like right. at least doing something constructive. And um, the same goes for like professional sportsmen. I, I find like I've, I've had a few guys on the, on the podcast and, you know, for them, that's been the, the most difficult transition ever is going from like a professional sportsman where you're training every day, going to matches, you, you're like well-known, you know, and then you become a normal civilian like the rest of us. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, half the guys there, they end up losing all their money. Uh, they become depressed. Like you yeah. really need almost someone to go, okay, cool. Here's my hand. Give me your hand. This is yeah, cool. right. You need to know. Hey. Yeah, exactly. I can imagine for, for a professional, you know, sports person, they're, they're spending so many kind of moments of their waking hours, either reviewing film or working out for their job, you know, preparing, um, yeah, to have that suddenly kind of go away, that vacuum uh, can be really dangerous where, you know, I was talking to, to some younger guys about, um, you know, where I've seen this go wrong. And it's like, okay, it's, you know, 830 in the morning, I don't have to go work out or review film, you know, 
maybe I should just start drinking beer. Like, you know, I mean, like there's all these things that like, and you know, Hey, once you start going down that road, like, you know, morning drinking, it's like, it doesn't end well, man. Like you, you know, there has to be something, uh, that you feel, uh, you're working towards that's still constructive and interesting. And yeah, I mean, I think, listen, I mean, the, on the one hand, I could imagine, you know, somebody listening to this being like, oh, you sold your company, like, must be nice. Like, I don't want to hear any complaints. It's like, believe me, I get it. You know, like, it's uh, it's a blessing beyond measure. Um, but everybody is the same. Like, people want to feel they're doing something constructive and interesting. They like to work with other people. We're social herd animals, man. And so we have our family. But, you know, we really need, like, relationships outside of that. Friends co-workers um and that can take all different shapes but you know when when the one guy was talking to me about this he's like all your friends are still going to be working during the day like you can't hang out with them during the day like it's hard to do right um so he's like you start to get so isolated that you like pull back and i've talked to so many entrepreneurs who like are i mean you know a billion dollar net worth and they are lonely, like starved for human contact. Um, and maybe, you know, they didn't have a, a stronger, you know, strong family structure. I, I don't know. I mean, they're, they're, everybody's different, but I can tell you that objectively people would be like, I've got no sympathy for that. That guy's rich, you know, he can do whatever he wants. But you actually talk to them personally. They're like, I sometimes just think about killing myself. Like they are on the edge of like depression and isolation. And yeah, it's just as important for them as it is for anyone to, to have those relationships, do something constructive. And I almost think it's, it's harder for somebody that has a big name and kind of notoriety, you know, cause they're used to like hiding, going into the back door at the restaurant, you know, not, you know, no autographs, like all that stuff for, for them. It's harder to like, Oh, okay. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to be a basketball coach. I'm going to, you know, like whatever, like, because people will bug them, right? It's another thing that I feel very fortunate that I was never like a big uh, uh, name, right? Like nobody knows who I am by and large. And uh, I think that's super, super nice, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, being famous must probably be one of the worst things in the world sometimes, agree, you know? Man. <laughs> like, you know, not being able to go to buy your groceries or something mm -hmm. and then like people are like hey could i have an autograph i mean you know it, it probably wears off quite soon um yeah. but one thing that you mentioned there that i think is important is like perception you know so like from the outside you know say looking at someone that sold their company you're like oh jeepers that guy must be happy as larry like he's you know he's got you know billions of dollars now and um he doesn't need any help like he can do whatever he wants but actually you know what they're thinking is so different, you know, the person that sold their company and they're like, like you said, they depressed and they're like lonely and they're like, what next? And, you know, perception is such a, such a big thing in life. Um, and I always think it's like important to never be afraid to reach out to people that you maybe think are maybe not necessarily in your circle or, you know, above you or, or anything like that. Like at the end of the day, we are all humans and, you can't run away from being a human, you know, and having your fears and your emotions and your hormones. And, and this is, so we all, we all kind of operate the same. It doesn't matter what you've achieved in life. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I uh, I've spent time with one guy who like, if I said the name, everybody knows this guy, right. And I'm not a name dropper. I don't hobnob with, you know, the rich and, and successful. Generally I'm, I'm hanging out with just, you know, regular people that I've always grown up with. I, I happen to get insight into this one guy um, uh, because we spent some time together for something and the human needs of just like recognition or like, Hey, that's a nice pair of shoes or like, you know, like good job on that is like just as present in him as it is in anyone. Right. Like, like it, it's, it's funny to me when people put people up on a pedestal, it's like, you have no idea. You really don't. I mean, I think social media also does that for a lot of people where we all know that that's an idealized version of that person that they want to put out there. Right. Um, 
And it's easy to, to convince yourself that it's really like that, right? Like that guy has the perfect marriage, the perfect family, the perfect business. Every investment he makes is a winner. You know, like, like I've started to like catch myself like, wow, that guy can do no wrong. But it's like, that's not true. It's not true for me. It's not true for anyone. And I've been guilty of that where, you know, taking success for like a great investment. It's like, well, yeah, I'm not talking about the other, you know, seven that, that, you know, did okay. And then the, the other three that like went to zero, like it's just human nature to not talk about those. But I try to force myself to talk about that because you don't want to convince people something that is not achievable or true. You need to, I think it's incumbent on people who have any sort of audience to talk about like mistakes, screw ups, failings, um, you know, bad investments, uh, uh, you know, because I don't know, we, we need to combat like the idea that everybody has this great life and everything is easy for, it's not true for anyone. Man. I, uh, I had a friend, well, I say friend, he's a guy I went to school with. Um, and, uh, I just had another mate message me this week and he's like, Oh, did you hear about Sipo? And I was like, no, he's like, Oh, he committed suicide. And mm -hmm. I was like, wow, that's crazy. And, you know, I, I haven't seen the posts or anything like that, but apparently like from all the posts, it's like, what this guy just seemed like the happiest guy ever. Like exactly two kids, wife, like, you know, always smiling, et cetera, et cetera. And it's like, like you said, it's, that's not the case. Mm -hmm. I, I had a lady actually on the podcast. Um, she said, her name is Shelly Paxton. And she said something like a one liner where you just go, whoa. She was like, social media is causing us to compare our insides to other people's outsides. Exactly. And I was like, yeah, you know what? That's so true. And you, and you just got to, you've always got to sort of just take a step back and sort of bring yourself into line and go, okay, cool. That is not necessarily the truth that's going on there. Um, I was wondering, Adam, like how do you use like social media and I'm maybe let's just talk about Twitter. Like how do you use it wisely? So the thing I love about Twitter is, uh, you know, I DM with a lot of people who just want like advice or feedback. Um, you know, maybe they're interested in, in, in entrepreneurship or they're, um, I mean, just, I, I have really, really interesting conversations with people through direct message, right? Um, and a lot of times I'm just like, hey, I might not, I, I'm not great at, at kind of responding to everything, but it'll be like, here's my cell phone. If you want to text me, like we could set up a call. And then I do these, um, I try to get 15,000 steps in every day, at least, which means, you know, you're walking like six or seven miles. And so I, I, I love to have phone calls with people while I'm doing my walks. Right. And so I, I, I love to just, um, you know, you, you kind of find like-minded people at first, just through what they're posting. And then you start to DM and it's like, Oh, this is an interesting person. Then like, Hey, let's have a phone call. And I have had like amazing conversations with like super, super, super interesting people. Um, like just amazing people, right? Like, like the guests you're going to have on your, your podcast upcoming, like I I've DM'd like with Chris many times, like he's an amazing dude. Like, I mean, you know, that's the power of the platform. I, I will say that I've stupidly like early on, I would get like confrontational with people. Cause there's always that like anonymous idiot where it's like, Hey, you know, this is what I'm trying to do. And it'll be like, you know, you're an idiot or, you know, like just, I mean, there's like people that just, I don't know why, but they just like swoop in and say something negative. Right. And I would start to get like, like, oh, that person hurt my feelings. I'm going to reply to them, or I'm going to try to convince them that they're wrong. And it's just like, it's stupid. Right. So I think if you can avoid kind of getting caught up in the negativity of that little, like 1% like group that just likes to like throw hand grenades, um, you can, uh, you can find amazing people. And I think you know, the number of followers someone has is usually not a good indication of like, like some of the people that I've had the most amazing conversations with have a very small presence on Twitter or LinkedIn or anything, right? 
So I think that's a mistake people make is that they kind of look for like, oh, this person has a big following. They must be like smart or important or whatever. It's like, no, a lot of that, it's kind of random, you know? Um, so anyways, those are some tips I have for, for that. I mean, I, I think the, uh, um, I try to um, give a lot of encouragement on Twitter when I see someone say like, Hey, I just started a company and I made my first like hundred dollars in revenue, you know, whatever. Right. Like, and like, nobody likes it or responds to it. I'm like, Hey, that's awesome. Like, cause it is, you know, like I, I would have loved to have had Twitter when I started my company. Um, just because like, it, it's really lonely, right. It's like, it's hard to like, who do you ask advice? Who, how, how can you, you know, and some of the stuff I see on Twitter is so high value. I'm like constantly bookmarking stuff as well. It's like, I need to watch that. I need to remember that. Like, it's an amazing resource. I think it's like a, a great platform. Uh, I, I kind of used to be a, a big Facebooky kind of Instagram person. And then I just, well, just totally almost don't use it anymore. Um, yeah. Or I'll post something and then ghost and just get away because I know that there's something... And it could just be a personality type of thing. Like I like reading things, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and understanding how people think. And, and like you said, there's so many amazingly smart people on, on Twitter that are sharing really cool stuff. And uh, I think, yeah, if you filter your feed uh, for what you actually, what is what n is nourishing uh, yeah. and interesting for your mind, then it's a whole different experience uh, compared to, you know, the opposite of that where you're getting angry and like you're comparing yeah. your life to other people and you're like feeling like negative about yourself and all these sort of things. So once again, it's it's like, it's almost social media is in its infancy. You know, we, we kind of, we need to learn how to use it properly. I think. Mm -hmm. There's something I tell my kids, uh, I've made them all listen to Earl Nightingale's The Strangest Secret, you know, that like 1950s recording. I love it. And, uh, and he says something in there where, where he says, you are what you think about all, all day long, right? He's quoting a, uh, like Marcus Aurelius or someone. But, you know, he's essentially saying you got to watch what you put in your brain because your brain's the most powerful kind of soil and any seed you put in it is going to grow, right? And you really have to control what you think about and how long you think about those things um, consciously. And I think you're right. Like on social media, you can set up a pretty good feed you know if you curate it and you you follow you know the right type of people that have positivity and have good you know interesting things uh, or you can just go totally off the rails and like consume so much negative content that like you're filling your brain with that stuff and you become a negative person you know so i always tell my kids that they're so sick of like me playing that on like car trips and things but it's like hey listen to this like this is true a hundred percent you are what you think about yeah absolutely um yeah, you become your thoughts, you know, effectively. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, like lots of people don't, don't realize how bad that negative self-talk is because a lot of people have it and, um, they wonder why they like, they feel down or depressed or, you know, just bad about life in general was because of their, their negative self-talk is, um, is kind of guiding their life. Um, so yeah, definitely, I think any tools that you have that can sort of change how you think um, or make you think like positively or find things that are interesting, et cetera, really help you, uh, sort of have a different perspective on life, which is, um, you know, separates you from other people. That's for sure. Adam, I know that you have like, uh, some quite strong, not strong, but like important views, I think on say education at the moment, like, um, if, if somebody was leaving school now and, and when I say school, I mean like high school. Okay. Uh, what would you kind of like recommend them doing in terms of a university versus, I don't know, maybe going traveling or starting an apprenticeship or, or something like that? Yeah. So, I, you know, I was, uh, I was invited to talk to a group of students at Virginia Tech recently. And I said something that maybe the, the professor, you know, wouldn't have wanted me to say, which is, you know, I think the world has changed quite a bit when it comes to a college education. And, okay, so 
when I was a, when I was 17, I worked during the summer doing construction. I saved money and I was able to pay for my entire tuition. Um, it was like $2,100 a semester. Um, college students can't do that now. They go into like large degrees of debt for a college degree. And if it's in an area that is not, um, okay. And so another thing, pe young people have been encouraged to, to just seek college degrees kind of as an, you know, an end in and of themselves without any thought towards, you know, employability or return on their investment. Um, and so, you know, I, I shared that one article about kind of how many people are underemployed five years after their degree. And, you know, the numbers were 45% overall, but for some majors, like 50, 60%, you know, they're, they're underemployed. They're in a job that doesn't require a four-year degree. You know, they're, 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 you know, maybe they're working, you know, kind of a, an entry-level job and they have this college degree that is not really serving them. So what I'm saying, and I tell my kids this too, um, I think there is a huge, huge benefit to travel. And if a, a young person were to say to me, I want to take a gap year and travel, um, I'd say, great. If they said, I want to do a, a, a study abroad, like, great, you know, do it. I mean, when I think back to college, I was fortunate enough to have this amazing professor who took like 20 of us across Europe right before the EU um, monetary integration. So they all the, you know, the each country had their own currency. They were scared they're going to go to this euro. He's talking to, you know, different businesses in 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 Spain. Spain, England, France, you know, it's just like this amazing trip. And I think I, I still think about that trip to this day. It's helped me in, in, in many ways. And so I, I think travel is so amazingly valuable. I think I don't want to see young people going into extreme amounts of debt for college degrees. I think some of, uh, I went I went to Northern Virginia Community College and got my welding certificate, um, which was, you know, just MIG, TIG welding. Um, and there were a bunch of young people in there who might not have had the greatest grades in high school, but they were going through the same welding certification program that I was. And they had a job offers for $100,000 plus to do welding on pipelines, to do welding on, you know, they were at 18, you know, potentially looking at like a six figure job without incurring a bunch of debt in college. And so, you know, they might have been looked down upon by their peers. Uh, oh, they're not going to college. They're, you know, they're, they're just welding. But it's like, I look at that and say, man, go take that job, get that experience, save some of your money, and you're going to be in an amazing position. If you want to go back and do online courses, the amount of material that is online is is amazing right now, and it's free. If you wanted to do a remote course and get your degree, if you wanted to eventually go back and get get your college degree, like I'm not anti-education by any means, but it, there is no longer a monopoly on success that means a four-year degree. Like there are many, many different pathways right now for successful people, and. Yeah, that's what I think. It's uh, it's not necessarily um, people think I'm like anti-college degree. No, not at all. Um, but I just want, I want what's best for young people. And I don't think it's, it's great for them to have a degree that is not practical and to have like hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt and then have a job that they're underemployed in. I think that is a, doing them an incredible disservice. And I think that's great advice as well. I think once you, once you get stuck with that debt at such a young age, um, it becomes quite difficult to to get out of it. You know, I actually, actually, the guy um, that I went to uh, UVA, um, he was one of my first coaching clients, and uh, at the time, and this was only like six years ago, he was like, "Yeah, no, I've still got my college debts. You know, like mm. hundred thousand or whatever it was, crazy amount to like to pay off. You know." Um, 
And I was thinking, that is madness, you know, like, um, and, and it definitely like America seems to be, you know, like at the sort of high end of, of that, um, when it comes to the amounts and, um, yeah, but, uh, but yeah, I, I think you know, like as well, what you said, traveling is, I actually think traveling is the best way to, to learn almost anything and it gives you to have that worldview, you know what I mean? Like to, to go and experience something for yourself rather than like what you might see on the news, you know, like right now, if you were watching the news, you know, and you were like, oh, Russians are, you know, they're just like all horrible people and blah, blah, mm. blah. Well, no, actually you should go to Moscow and you should um, go out for a night in Moscow, go to one of their uh, karaoke evenings and, you know, or just walk around and, and go and speak to some people and <laughs> meet the McDonald's, whatever it is. And you'll find like, they, they're kind of just like you and me, you know, they're just, they're just normal people. And um, actually seeing things for yourself, experiencing things for yourself, even like what you were saying about traveling in Europe before the Euro, like experiencing different currencies and having to calculate things and stuff mm -hmm. like that. That's like, that's real world experience. You know what I mean? You don't learn that stuff in university. So I'm a big one for, yeah, just go, go out there and um, yeah, get amongst it. Like rather than getting yourself into huge debt uh, because yeah, that's a, that's a difficult one to get out of. Yeah. I think especially for Americans, you know, we have this big country and a lot of my relatives, for example, have never traveled outside of the country. You know, like they can uh, say, hey, we can we can go see a lot of different things and still be in the United States, which is true. You know, you can go out west. You can go. I mean, it's just we have this, you know, we're blessed. Um, but you tend to get like a very U.S. centric view of the world. Um, and the world is so amazing and interesting and, and, you know, just, just spending time in different cultures. Uh, you know, we've, I'm a believer that you take your kids with you everywhere. So Lila and I traveled a lot while we were, while we were, you know, didn't have kids while we were married. And then as soon as our kids, like even we're little babies, like we'd take them to Mexico, we just wherever we went, right. If we're working on like something philanthropic, we take them. If it's a vacation, we take them. If it's a business trip, we'd take them, you know, go to Japan for a business trip. Like, the whole family's going, you know, uh, we're going to experience Kyoto. We're going to experience Tokyo and, and, you know, I'll do some meetings and I, and I won't be with you the whole time, but like, and so one of the things I try to encourage um, kind of young dads, especially is like, let's normalize taking your kids into even like a business meeting. Like if someone says, Hey, I've got my daughter with me for the day. Is it okay if she comes into this meeting at your, it's like, of course, bring her in, you know? Um, so I really, I think that's another way that we can kind of help the younger generation is just like, let's bring them with us, you know, like, let's not say, oh, that's a, you know, I mean, we've brought our kids into places that people were like, it's too dangerous for kids. And we're like, we're going to be fine, you know? And we were. Some of my greatest memories are going to work with my, my mom and my dad and, you know, my mom worked in a hospital and. I would, uh, I mean, yeah, I'd run around the hospital and, uh, just, just, you know, learn different things, I guess. And then my dad, I would go to his, his like company and they were engineers and just even just the fact of meeting other parents and, or elders, you know, and having right. their influence and them like going, Hey Gareth, like, come here, come, you know, come play this computer game or something and, or come and, uh, you know, come and check this, uh, a technical drawing that I'm doing or whatever. And mm -hmm. it's like, like I, I can, I can even feel like to this day, like those sort of things, you know? And, uh, I think, yeah, encouraging your kids and encouraging people that have businesses to allow that stuff is, right. is, is great and a necessity. Yeah. Let's do it. I mean, just, you know, next time you're visiting someone for business, like say, Hey, is it cool if my kid tags along? Like I've never had anyone say like, that's inappropriate. And I've certainly always said like, we'd love it. You know, like when kids come into my office, everybody's like, great, you know, this is, this is awesome. Um, yeah. So I think, I think, you know, cause, cause just like you, I mean, I, I was hanging out in my dad's office, hanging out on the job sites. They would have me crawl through like pipes they were putting under the roads. Cause I was the only one that could fit. And, you know, I'd pull a rope through it or whatever. And I'd be like a little hero, like, Hey, you did it. You know, I'm sure. Like it wasn't, OSHA approved, but uh, 
probably some safety standards that were broken routinely in my family, but um, it made me feel important and like, like I'm contributing and, you know, great memories, just like you say. Actually thinking back now that we're talking about it, I, I've uh, got this awesome memory and I've actually got a photo of it uh, in 2010 was the soccer world cup in South Africa. Mm. And the final was at this, this um, stadium called soccer city. And my dad actually built the original soccer city. Right. Uh, so, I mean, way before that, I don't know, in the nineties. Mm. And um, I've got photos of me running around. They have this like moat around it, right. To separate the crowd from the field. I've got like a photos of me running around the, the moat, but also on the actual pitch, kick, kick, kicking a rugby ball. Oh, cool. And I was like, I mean, that that's a memory you have forever. You know, like you say to somebody, if you see that World Cup stadium, you know, you see the guys saying, I, I was there when it was being built. And that's just a cool thing to do, you know. It's a cool bonding moment as well for you and your kid. Like you'll probably never really even know how much that meant to them um, when they're older and stuff. Like, so very cool thing to do. Adam, I was wondering... Um, you know, as we sort of maybe start finishing up a little bit, you live on this like ridiculously massive piece of land. I think it's like 550 acres. Yeah. Uh, I mean, what's it like, like living on such a huge property? Yeah. So it's, um, it's, uh, so we have, we have the farm, the 550 acre, we call it a farm. It's almost all forest land. Um, then we have a house in Fairfax and we kind of go between the two and, the 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 land as i bought it on the shenandoah river was just raw you know it was just like a forested mountainous like it was just like what are we going to do with this and so we we cleared an area out planted it with an orchard um uh and then we're like okay it's too remote to get power so we um you know put in this like underground vault with batteries and solar panels. And then we had power to run a sawmill. We cut trees down, built a cabin out of it. Um, then ran the power over and, and built this geothermal greenhouse. And so it's kind of like bootstrapping everything. And, you know, we, we keep bees out there. We forage, we, we um, ride ATVs and motorcycles. Um, the scout troop, uh, that my son is a member of is going to camp there in two weekends. Um, it's just like a, it's like, you know, it's like a world of nature and our kids have grown up in it to the point where like my kids are totally comfortable just like sleeping on the ground, you know, no tent. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're very kind of nature oriented. I will say there's whining a lot of times where it's like, why do we have to, you know, trim all these apple trees like you know my friends don't have to do this um you know but then their friends will go out there and be like oh my god you guys get to do this every you know anytime you want and then they're like proud of it you know so it's like we just wanted somewhere where our kids could grow up with that and maybe someday you know they'll want to bring their kids onto it um it's a really special place uh when you're there you can't see one artificial light anywhere. Like it's just, it's, it's not far from Washington, DC. It's an hour West of Washington, DC, but it feels like you're like in the middle of nowhere. Um, and you kind of are in the middle of nowhere. You're, you're kind of in these, you know, Appalachian mountains uh, right on the river. So it's a thing that requires a lot of work. Um, there's a lot of like every week there's like work to do and, Sometimes you pull in there and there's like a giant tree is falling across the road and it's like, okay, get the chainsaw out. Like forget what I thought I was going to do. I now have to do this or, you know, the generator's broken. We have to fix that. Um, but it's part of this ethos that we have on uh, self-reliance. And so you got to figure it out. Like no repairman is going to come out here and, and help us. Like we have to figure this out. And I think for kids, like, exposing them to those type of scenarios is really important. It's like, there's no price you can put on that experience, you know, like, and, um, you, you, your kids would, the experience of life is, is so different to, to other kids. And, um, yeah, I don't, they don't yet know how fortunate they are. You know, like you said, they'll moan about cutting the the apples off the trees, but (laughs) 
you know, 10 years time when they, um, you know, when they're older and they, they realize, ah, oh, Dan was right. You know, <laughs> this, this is actually cool. Uh, so yeah, no, look, look, I mean, it looks amazing. One thing, um, that I thought was also cool is that you've got like caves on your, mm -hmm. um, on your land. And, and I had an experience when I was in uh, Laos and, um, my mates and I were just like on these scooters and we, we were going to like walk to this cave and go for a walk. And then this guy came like running up to us, like as we were going to walk into the cave and he's like, Hey, do you want a guide? And we were like, Oh, you know, well, no, not really. <laughs> and he's like, no, well, you really should get a guide. Like, <laughs> you know, and we, we, we were like, ah, okay, cool. Let's get a guide, you know? And so we started walking through these, these caves and I'm not even joking, like these caves were 25 kilometers deep. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, and I mean, we only went about 10 Ks, but he was saying, this guide was saying, yeah, well, you know, a few weeks ago, there was an Italian guy that went walking and he didn't want a guide and he never came out because, you know, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's like a maze inside of there. And I'm so glad that we did. And it was just like this crazy experience where we were having to leave certain bits of luggage because it wasn't big enough to get through or we had mm -hmm. to swim to get somewhere and um it, it takes a certain bit of courage and you know uh, you've got to not struggle with claustrophobia to to go in those caves you know we uh it, virginia's blessed with limestone caves so giant caverns i mean you know with the stalactites thing i mean just we have a lot of caves and we found one that we didn't know about on the property and it looked like just kind of a hole with some rocks around it you know about like that big around and when we got there, my 18-year-old was like, I'm going in first. And I was like, go for it, man. And he squirmed down in there and started, and he's like, okay, you know, I can stand up. I, you know, but when I took a video of it and and showed people, they're like, you let your son go in first. It's like, yeah, I did. Like he's he's done this before. And for him, it was like, I'm the man, you know, like I was the first one in there. And uh, you know, it it feels great to to do that stuff um and just let kids like i don't know i think we we tend to you know protect kids too much and kids want to seek adventure you know like they want to do these things i think the best thing you can teach your kid is like resilience you know mm -hmm. and you know you forget things like teaching them happiness and all that sort of nonsense not nonsense but you know what i mean like you yeah. want to teach them like you know, how to be resilient, how to be tough, how to, because that's the real world at, at the end of the day. Exactly, so, right. Uh, and once again, those things is exactly how you learn it. And and courage, you know, courage and confidence and all that stuff, like mm -hmm. that just comes through doing those difficult things. So I think it's great. Um, okay, Adam, uh, just uh, just the sort of a uh, couple of last questions. If, if people want to sort of get hold of you, um, interested to find out more, what what's the kind of best way? Yeah, I mean, the, the best way for me is, is Twitter X, uh, at Rossi Adam. Um, if, uh, you know, if we, um, uh, connect through, through DM, um, you know, we can then like exchange phone numbers, you know, like I said, I like to have like voice conversations with people. Um, so I like to do that. And then, uh, you know, I have a LinkedIn profile. I'm getting a little more, uh, active again on LinkedIn. Uh, it's more, you know, obviously kind of business oriented, but, um, but either one of those places is is cool. Okay, awesome. And uh, my final question is, what does being ridiculously human mean to you? Man, I think uh, I think it's I think it's living up to the potential that we all have, and I think people self limit so much that if you could just remove some of your internal limitations that are only in your own mind we can do so many amazing things and have so many amazing experiences. Um, if we could just like get out of our own way. Is there any advice like for somebody listening, like how they could get out of their own way? I'll tell you one thing that's real simple. Get your ass out of the house and go take a trip somewhere that you would never think you would go to. Like if I'm stuck and I'm just like in a funk or a rut, it's like, all right, let's go to Peru. Like, let's go somewhere like different, you know, like, cause I guarantee you, you can't go to an interesting place like that and still be in a rut. Like, it's just not possible. That's amazing, but yeah, I love it. And, um, 
Yeah, just from my side, I just wanted to say a huge thank you for for coming on the podcast. Uh, it's a uh, it is like a, a true honor to to be able to speak to somebody like yourself. I think you you're an extremely humble guy. Uh, you know, people definitely probably through this conversation won't recognize like maybe how well you have really done in life, you know, and um, the sort of success that you experience in business. And I think that says a lot about you, you know, because um, you don't need to talk about yourself, your, your confidence in in who you are and, and what you've done. And I think uh, anyone that sort of comes across your path uh, in, in real life um, definitely must be uh, super fortunate and and learn a hell of a lot from you, I'm sure. So just wanted to say thanks so much for for sharing your story and and your wisdom with me. And uh, I really look forward to launching this in the future. And who knows, maybe one day meet you in person. That'll be awesome. For sure, man. We got to go to a, a Virginia Tech football game. And uh, listen, thanks so much for having me as well. I love your kind of positive outlook and message. And uh, I really appreciate what you're doing, kind of getting that getting that message out there in the world. I think it's you know super beneficial. Cool. Thanks so much, bud. Thank you.